as he spread the knowledge around the stage in that style that he's known that's become famous. Let me first tell you, to strike out against white supremacy at the core, at the top, where Steve Coakley has, brings about danger. It brings about a danger that we must protect him. We must also economically support him because he's not going to get a dime from them. When I tried to get Steve on the radio in Philadelphia, they asked me, was I mad? They asked me, had I taken leave of my census? Because he's known for naming the names of those who strike out against us and work in league against African redemption. He gives names and addresses. So therefore, we're no longer struggling against this Democrat and this Republican. We're not even concerned with no beat cop. We want to know who's at the top and pulling the strings. And he's going to bring that information to you. Hey, listen, I'm proud to say in our midst, and I'm proud of you for giving him this great greeting to show you that there's support for the Felders and Coakley. I'm proud of this turnout. Give yourself a hand. I'm out of the way. Brother Steve Coakley. Now, I don't want to be accused of waking nobody up tonight, so I don't want them arresting me here in Pennsylvania for waking up the people. So I catch three people sleep, I'm out of here. Both and peep with their other eye just to see who's going to fall asleep with them. So if you see somebody head nod, then they got the one eye open, they try and encourage others. You know, like you yawn and others go, watch them now. We're going to work them tonight. Uh, it is uh, a pleasure. Uh, and a humbling uh, opportunity to be here uh, before you to give some small level of service. Uh, this is, uh, on one hand, it looks to a lot of people uh, like a, a very enjoyable, entertaining moment. Uh, but also with great opportunity is great danger. So I feel blessed uh, to be here, to have the opportunity to be healthy, to be straight, to be honest as best we can with our people about the circumstances that we're suffering from. Uh, on numerous occasions, uh, I do uh, run into different difficulty uh, whenever I come. It is never my goal to be with everybody because everybody isn't worth being with. And that's a very honest statement that we have to grapple with when we deal with each other. Everybody, even amongst us, is not for us. And we have to have some way to sort ourselves out to find a way that we can find some commonality to work out a problem with someone who's bugging us bigger than some of the nuances and things that we're suffering from. Uh, you all hear me all right? Y'all all right down? You can't hear me back there? Who said no? Y'all can't hear good back there? Is it better if I talk louder or is it not clear? Well, y'all get y'all butt down here in the front, shit. <laughs> Are y'all back? Come on, it's still time. Y'all can sit down here in the front. I spit on the front rows. Come on down here. <laughs> now, I see this stage be a little shaking here, J Dale. Now, I know it got to be strong on this part because you were standing on this part, but this part here, you ain't standing on that back part. All right. Uh, one, let me say, uh, I know brother told me we got about two hours. So I'm going to go two hours plus when it's over. Uh, we had a little meeting uh, while we were here earlier. And some of those lectures, I know I was at New Jersey, that was five and a half hours. Uh, I know we were at the slave the first time, it was four and a half hours. On that second time, they literally threw me out of there with the lights blinking. So the point is, is that as we get to go somewhere around that two hour part, it, 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 when we'll have to stop will literally be just a moment that we stop until we come back again I think we're going to do something again uh, real soon here in Philadelphia and uh, I feel uh, honored and uh, that'll be announced soon uh, you listen closely to Brother Dell and he will make you aware of those things uh, this uh, for me uh, will be a lecture entitled Coakley Does Philadelphia uh, on some of those tapes over there is uh, like a Coakley Does Los Angeles and 
Coakley does Minnesota and Coakley does Los Angeles. What the Does series is, is it usually has that local boule in it. And as you hear, when I call the names of those members here in your town, you will shout back at me what it is they do so that the people in the other cities who are studying uh, the dilemmas that you're suffering from as well as you're responsible for knowing what's wrong in L.A. If you all have seen, uh, we just left L.A. recently, you saw the Rodney King thing going on. Now the Rodney King thing is going on so deep, it's my prediction that when this trial is over that this brother is going to jail for assault because they have turned the thing around so you will swear that he did the beating. At one point we saw where the judge was watching the attorneys get two people disagreeing on what they saw. And the, the attorney was making his point that this disagreement, this inability for the two people to see the same thing was going to void Rodney King's standing. And the judge got a little sick out. He said, well, hold it. We got the videotape over here. Why do I care which one didn't see it right when I can see it all right there? And so, <laughs> we still got the pop in it. Let me Ah, okay. All right. Got to make the pop. Got to make the pop. Say, don't drink, no drink. You didn't pour. And 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 everybody is worth protecting. Don't think anyone in our race is not worth protecting. We we need to protect all of us. This echo is kind of an echo up here. I'm not. I don't know if I'm hearing myself right. We can hear you right. You all right? I know you can. I'm still worried about them ones in the back back there. Okay, so we're going to do Philadelphia tonight. And there's a process about doing it. Uh, in each of those cities, I ask them, uh, who are the big white people in your town? Now, I want someone or any of you or all of y'all should holler it out together. Who's the richest, most powerful white man in Philadelphia? Boom. Who? Now hold it, y'all. Oh, oh, stop. Everybody be quiet a minute. I want y'all to hear this. I want y'all to hear this because there's some lesson in this. I want you all, now everybody holler out, just free for all. Holler out the name of the richest, most powerful white man in Philadelphia. Annenberg. Who else? Gardner. What was that name? What was that? Thornburg. Oh, he's the, the guy was the little attorney guy? He don't own nothing, but he, he's an operator. The Minton, oh, he black guy? He just a little guy. Who, who else? The Rouse? Rouse family? Got a couple of nods on the Rouse. So Anberg and Rouse, and who else? Who? What's the name he said? Davenport? Davenport. Is that it? Rappaport. Rappaport. What do they do? They want property? Who else? What? Q's? Q's. Q's. H. What did he say? Come on. How loud? I got one. The Hughes. Humes. Hughes. Hughes. H-U-G, H-U-G-H-E-S. B, Pews. P, Pews. Oh, P-E-W-S. Oh, yeah, them foundation people. Oh, yeah, 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 they on there. Who else? Fitz Dixon. The Kellys. Who else? Okay, fuck the Pews, fuck the Annenbergs, fuck the Kellys. Fuck all of them, right? But next time I come here, all of you all better together holler them names a little better than you holler them Africans. Because ain't no Africans walking around Philadelphia and don't have a better tab on the whites who got their thumb or their foot on their neck. So next time you Africans, when y'all come back and y'all should say, Hughes, Hughes, y'all should, all them names should be hollering together because you all should have thought about it well and had a better grasp on who we're after. Check. Check mean I understand. Check. So that next time I come, all of you Africans, because see, y'all will tell me, I'll be at that table, y'all show me them bogards, y'all will tell me how much y'all love me, y'all will tell me how much you love them tapes, but if I ask you them white people's names and you don't know them, then I don't know you. Because I don't know how much you can take that you haven't gotten mad enough to go get their names. 
And that's why I get in trouble because don't nobody want to accept the fact that with all Afrocentric clothes, change their names, eating vegetarian food or something else, and we still sitting up ain't got no good African grasp of who we're after. And what is missing in our relationship with each other is who got us, who fucked us. Look at around in the room and look at the difference in your skin complexions. Y'all not mad still? Now I sat around, I just left Ohio. And in Ohio, there are all kind of evidence of great Native American cultures, Indios cultures, people of the high civilization. And I remind those people there in Ohio that there was probably a meeting just like this where everybody talked just like we talk and everybody walked out the room and made the wrong decision. Now the wrong decision is, is that the relationship that you have with the ones that we're after inhibit the rest of the race of doing what is necessary. How can we overthrow the University of Pennsylvania? A Masonically found school, the Masons built that school. Now how can we overthrow that school when there's black people in it? How can a black person go to the Mason, the one who called us three-fifths of a man when he wrote the document called the Constitution? Now, how can anyone go there or stand around them? Now, I hear they're pretty tough around here, check. Check. Okay. So, how can anyone go there when we're trying to stop the extension of this Masonic secret thing? How can someone go to their feet and pay them to teach them something that they don't even know? Now, it's not one school that I go to that I ask those questions about who is in control of the various things that anyone who claim they got a degree should be aware of. How many of y'all got college degree in here? Raise your hand. How many, raise, get your hands up high. Now I will tell you, if there's a revolution tomorrow, when we start having the new administrations, when you stand up in line and say what your value is, don't say I got no degree from Temple, or I got a degree from Penn, or I got a degree from Harvard, Yale, Howard, Hampton, in the new situation, the old shit is dead. Check. So if you ain't got it, don't worry about it. You ain't going to need it. Now, it's going to be hard for a lot of us to break away. See, we are trying to get a revolution going. I have to admit, I can't reform the thing I'm after. I can't petition it. I can't vote it out. The remedy for the thing we're suffering from, we have yet to bone up to, so we keep coming up with the wrong solutions. Your foot is hurting and you keep wrapping something around your shoulder blade. We are not applying the medicine to where it's hurting. So we keep coming up with the wrong remedy, and then we look at each other and think somehow we failed when I think we ain't really tried. I think if each and every one of you had a black book, and you were responsible for taking over where you were standing, and you had the names of the one that for years after years after years then fucked you and your daddy and your mama and your grandmama and your grandmama's grandpapa. If you had those names in your hand, you would act better. I make that suggestion to you. Therefore, pass all of the things that we spend all our time doing. We done been to a lot of lectures. We done been to a lot of churches. We done been to a lot of meetings, right? But we still walk up out of there and ain't got them names in our hand. We are not yet prepared to go after those ones who done fucked us on every round. Now, we come to some, then all of a sudden the things we do ought to change. Somehow we ought to quit doing some of the things we've been doing to show that we are act better when we think better. So ain't no need of nobody picking up no Coakley tape. And walk around and say, brother boy, I heard that tape. And then when you look up, it didn't initiate you to go to your local thing and to chase them down. I make this suggestion to you, that if you went to your local United Way, now it's maybe two, three, four hundred people in this room. I can't count. Dale, you did good tonight, brother. You, you did good tonight, brother. Now, I suggest to you that if you went to your local United Way in Philadelphia, and you pulled out from them the file on all the people in Philadelphia that they gave grants to, I suggest to you, you're gonna fall out your chair when you read it closely, because if you take the time to look, like somebody asked, I think earlier was, uh, what about the CIA in the room or something? Well, I wanna suggest to you that the CIA don't have to come out here as the CIA when they got the United Way in place. Because the United Way will fund the type of things that the CIA need to know. 
Now somebody walk up to you and you start getting over in Philadelphia, somebody come to you and say, you need to be in some leadership training. They ain't training no leaders in America. Ain't no beast training no leaders. Right? Check. So, but everybody's sweating. If they go to the class, somebody, usually the enemy, gonna appoint them and make them something. And they gonna walk around with some certificate talking about what they know. But if you go down to the United Way and look for certain buzzwords like rumor control network, conflict resolution, uh, monitor developing racial tension, uh, uh, eyes and ears operation, listening post. If you go down there easing racial tensions, if you go down there and look very carefully, you will find people that you know taking money from the United Way that if they did what they were asked to do, there's no need for the CIA in the community as long as the United Way is in the community. Now all around the country I had gone and preached on the United Way. Now up a month ago they exposed a white boy and now they've exposed other white boys in the United Way that have been living high off of the money. Now immediately any of you at any job should not give them the one dollar because just the one dollar is enough to say you agree with what they're doing and I'm telling you what they do is kill the race. Check. Yeah. Now if 10 of you went down there and asked to see them proposals, they gonna shit in their pants because ain't nobody ever went down there and checked. The white people who we have, they ain't never been chased. So if you went down there and started acting, they have to show you the information because they not for profit tax exempt. Check. Yeah. So you have all the rights because you're the one that's supposed to be serving. So if you go and you ask for the information, let one of you come back and tell Dale Jones that you went there and couldn't get it. I just wish somebody would go down there and be turned down, because next time we come, we'll all go there. How many of y'all want to go to United Way with me? Because I suggest that if we all went together and pulled the books out, y'all going to drop dead when y'all see who on the tape. Now, y'all got some local foundations here, some little local people who give, who give away money to make sure everybody be cool. Usually, the local utility got a foundation. Usually, there's a community trust here. Usually the Ford, the Rockefeller, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, the Sloan Kettering Fund, the Pew Tr Charitable Trust, and others, Field Foundation, have outlets here where they finance people for different reasons. Anybody here who knows anything about the issue of social work, all a rich white man want to know is them little alcoholics, the ones who drink too much alcohol, Keep watch on them for me, will you? Because one day they could get kind of out of hand and come fuck up my thing. <laughs> so they pay people called alcoholism treatment workers to go out there and keep tabs on the ones who abuse alcohol. Not because they want to cure them, they tell them they're uncurable. They got it forever. Check. So, so, therefore, since it ain't going down, it's going up. The reality of it is, is that they're paid to watch people who the rich white people are scared of. They're more scared of 10 alcoholics than they are of a thousand Africans. I'm telling you the truth. Then they look over and they say, what about them people walking around looking all crazy and shit? So I want y'all, here's 20,000 a year, watch them motherfuckers for me. Because it's one thing I can't stand if I got 400 million, is I have some little crazy somebody run up and shake my shit and kick my ass and I can't spend my money. So they pay somebody to be the mental health worker who passes out Thorazine and all that other knockout shit to go and to hold down the element that the white man believes that would scare him or take his money if they, because they didn't know no better. See, y'all are reasonable. Y'all are reasonable. So they figure at some point they can reason you out of it. But see, them other ones, they're more scared. So give me 15 mentally ill people. I whip all y'all. Because they don't know no better. They're fighting. But understand what I'm, I'm trying to make a point. Somebody say, well, here come the CIA. Well, if you work for the Urban League, and you know you leave your agency one day to go out and attend a meeting, you got a right to goddamn meeting up, else you can't get back in your job the next day. Any of you all at a community organization that's getting funded, when you leave that agency, you got to write a meeting attendance form and tell them what the fuck you heard at the meeting. Am I lying? Jack. So what are we looking for the CIA when they're sitting all up in our face under other names? We ain't looking for nobody. Don't tell me y'all we looking for them, because they be sitting right there. How God running around loose, but we ain't got nobody fighting the devil. 
It's all these spots where they're fighting God, but they ain't kicking no devil in the ass. Devil doing pretty goddamn good. Devil's pretty successful here in the land of the hallows. Devil doing pretty damn good. It's many people. I check Cecil Rhodes. Check the Rothschild. There's a moment when they all say, you know, look like there ain't no God. I'm getting with the devil. Because he looks like he's doing better than God's doing. Now everybody swear they're good in God. Now let's have a little check here, right? Let's have a little check. Y'all tell me what's better. Now this, is, this ain't got nothing to do with me or you personally. You tell me what's better. A lion vegetarian or a truth-telling pork eater? <laughs> what's better? So don't put petty pressure on each other about who's the blackest by what you ate. It's what you did with what you ate. Right? But see, we got a lot of ways where we put the thing on each other, and by putting the thing on each other, we hold each other back on their relevant shit. See, I watch a lot of people play black on each other. I'm blacker than you. And then they do the black thing on each other and don't nothing get done. The enemy remains. What's a, what's a nice white neighborhood around here? Roxborough, where else? What's the name? Balaginwig. What? Mainline. How about we have a meeting in their neighborhood one day? How about we just go walk around there one day? Just single file line on the sidewalk. Just walk there till we get tired. I guarantee you if we didn't touch one person or say one thing, the police, the tank, and the rest will show up. But you need to see them. Unless you know they're there, you won't always operate like you know it can happen at any minute. Our people believe the white man. We believe he's going to be in the position he in forever. Therefore, we ain't trying to do nothing. We need to know, be able to do the type of thing that makes him unable to sleep at night. I'm proud that I have caused many white people cancer. I'm proud of that. The cancer is, is that when their name goes in the tape, when they say, when their name goes in the tape, and the tape goes anywhere, y'all come to me, people I've never seen in my life, and told me about what tapes and this and things you heard, I ain't even in control of that. That thing go, got a life of its own. I couldn't stop it if I wanted to. But once he knows his name goes in there, he don't know which one of you gonna give him what he got coming, but once his name goes out, every time he rolls his ass over in that bed, he thinks when you might be at his door, and you need to have that pressure on them. Just last Sunday, I was in, uh, last Sunday, I was in uh, Wheeling, West Virginia, where the Rockefeller family went. One of the Rockefellers went to West Virginia. On our way out of there, we heading back to Washington, like just the next night. We heading back to Washington, and I hear a radio show in Chicago. We in the hills of Pennsylvania. In fact, why is it on Pennsylvania where the highway signs in, they look like the little ketchup bottle? <laughs> Why didn't y'all name their name when I was hollering out them names? They in Delaware? Oh, okay. Ain't they, ain't they signs in Pennsylvania? In Pennsylvania, ain't they ones got the ketchup thing on the highway? Look like the label of Heinz ketchup got the highway number in it. Ain't that this the spot? Okay, then. They in Pittsburgh. They on the campus, too? The Campbell family? Yeah, fuck them, too. Right. Now. See, now, yes, <laughs> shame, shame, shame. But we got to do this because people love these people. They sit up and say, oh, you wonder, maybe he'll do all right, maybe one day. Fuck that, they never coming around. The ones we're after are never coming around, never, ever. I don't care what you say, what you do, what you show for, whatever they've done, they are never coming around. So they have to be asked to leave or they have to be forced to go. And that's the only thing that's going to get us out of the jam we in, else they're going to kill our ass. And that's just straight. Ain't no, ain't no crook in that. Now, I don't care if I'll never get the money. They're going to come get us if we don't stop and prepare to stop them. And when you put their name out there, and when you walk that street, and they're in that street, and they know you know who they are, that scares them because if you look at them carefully, they're wide open for your influence. Here's a man sitting way at the top of the hill in a $300 house. Close off two roads and walk up in his glass window one night with five people and see if he don't do everything he can do. I mean, if he got $400 million, he'll give you $10 million just to walk out that room and don't kill him. I'm telling you, white people, influential white people that have hurt our race are not suffering from an overdose of retaliation. 
They have never been chased. No one has ever come to some conclusion about all their bad behavior. So I present to you, hear ye, hear ye, tonight the white supremacists are on trial. I am the prosecutor, you are the grand jury, and it's my job to present to you the evidence to get these indictments. <laughs> right? Now I offer you, in the conspiracy to aid and abet the killing of the white race, I offer to you the United Way as a spot you should go to get some relief. One, you should all stop giving your money there, and two, you should go find out who they gave the money to. Just as a check. You go do that, you'll be in good shape. Good shape, good shape. Uh, what's the biggest bank in uh, Philadelphia? What's the name? Core State? First Pennsylvania? What's the name of the chairman? What's the name of the chairman? What? Terry? Terry Larson. That's the name of the chairman? Y'all show? Who worked there? <laughs> he know, right? Right? Okay. Keep your eye on him. Get your money out to white banks. Get your money out of all the banks. I got to be honest with you. Any bank that's under the control of the U.S. government, get your money out their bank. Your money is safer in a sock under your pillow than in their bank. That's what I'm telling you honestly. Now, Dale Jones don't take all this money tonight and put in no bank. Hide it. Because uh, it ain't going, that, that thing ain't safe. Got to stay off of them. How many of y'all in here got credit cards? How many of y'all in here owe white people money? <laughs> Let me, oh, y'all lying. Let me see, get your hands up. How many of y'all in here owe white people money? Okay, the tip is if we win, you free. If we win, debt's over. Now, I want to tell you something. In carefully studying revolution, every time there was a revolution, everyone got overthrown but the money lender. Every time there was a revolution, everybody got overthrown but the money lender. Just the other day, just the other day, I had an article up here where the Ukrainians had a meeting, right? The meeting was over, the meeting was over. What are we gonna do with the debt from Gorbachev, Brezhnev, Andropov, Khrushchev, and the rest of them? Said, what are we going to do with the debt? So this announcement here was, this is LA Times, Saturday, May, March 14, 1992. Ukraine agrees to pay its share of the Soviet debt. After intense pressure from Western bankers, including a threat to cut off foreign credits, Ukraine on Friday agreed to accept collective responsibility for the estimated $68 billion debt left by the Soviet Union when it dissolved. It didn't dissolve, it was revolted. But why, when there was a revolution, was there a desire for the last group to pay the debts of the ones they overthrew? Now, there's a little hip in there. Got to pick up on this. Here's it. Have y'all seen that South African thing? Y'all seen the South African thing? Here's, a, here's the Financial Times. You might not see this much. Where the cameraman? This the camera right there? Put the close-up on. So y'all got to work. Who working the cameras tonight? Ain't nobody working the cameras? Y'all got to work. See, I jump off the picture. See, I ain't on the picture now. So they lazy. They had to get up and work the camera. There you go. What about the other camera? Is both them cameras go to the same house? Different, who different house? Who, how many houses you got in there? Ain't one house. Ain't one house? All right. This article right here. This is uh, the Financial Times. February 8th, 1992. Now, many of you might not get this newspaper. It costs a dollar and a quarter a day. This is one of the best newspapers on the planet. Not because it's truthful, but because this is where the white money boys talk. And it's always important for us to listen to the money boys because they're the baddest of the white boys. Right? Check. Now, let me catch you chasing no damn clan. Because they don't run First Penn or University of Penn, nor Temple. They don't run shit in Philadelphia, right? Except for their house or their barn or their yard or their outhouse or some shit like that. Now, the article here says, Mandela calms investors' fears. Mandela. Now, on my way through this lecture, I got to give you a couple of little updates. The anti-apartheid movement has officially failed. It fucked up. It let the white man off the hook and he ain't done shit. He ain't done shit. I got articles up here like, 
This is in Dayton. I was just in Dayton. Here's the story. An end to apartheid. It's on the vote, right? They had to vote. And the headlines is, when the little the clerk shit passed, the end of apartheid. Now, any of you, like I know, like you know, the shit ain't stopped. In fact, they had proposed that the damn election ain't going to be till 96. But the white boys say it's over, right? And by acquiescence, it's so, because we ain't said it ain't so. Now, I'll make a point to this. The African Revolution was the fuse point for the world revolution. The African Revolution was the fuse for the world revolution. And if you dissipate or dissolute or bust down that one, you bust it down your own. Now, Mandela is here in the Financial Times. See, you, this ain't in the local Philadelphia Inquirer or some shit like that. This ain't in the local stuff because they don't want the masses of the people, especially the people who gave up the 9 million and sent them back to Africa with the 9 million. There's no black group in America with $9 million in it. So he left here with 9 million. That all didn't come from us. But anyway. Mandela made a determined effort yesterday to reassure the international business community about the economic policies of the post-apartheid South Africa. Now this was right before the vote. Now the only way the rich white boys was going to keep throwing the money down to help the de clerk thing pass was if the brothers who would take over would agree not to fuck with the money. Check. See, they'll let you take over. Good could take over, but he couldn't fuck with the money. In fact, they set up a financial control board, didn't they? To take control of the money. Same shit they got in New York. Same shit they got in Cleveland. Same shit they got in Chicago. Same shit they got in L.A. Same shit they got everywhere we took over. Check. Now, five of y'all gonna fall asleep when we stop fucking with the white money, people, because everybody think that's boring. If living ain't worth stand awake for, then take your ass on to sleep. <laughs> the ANC statement on foreign debt. I want you to hear this because I want you to know what you fell for because we still got to work our way out of this dilemma. The dilemma is, is that the anti-apartheid movement failed because it failed to put pressure on the real power holders in South Africa. The real power holders are the Anglo-American Corporation. The De Beers Diamond people, the Consolidated Gold, them Hasidic Jewish people up there in New York with them long beard black hat wearing fuckers running around 46th Street up there. They need their ass kicked. They need their ass kicked. You can say it, Steve Coakley said, them Hasidic Jewish people that control 80% of the diamonds that come to America from South Africa need their ass kicked and you need to kick their ass. Check. Stop now. You're going to have to kick the nigger's ass in New York first because the nigger up there sitting right around him don't want to fuck with him. Check. Check. See, the nigger sitting right there got enough informants in the street to make them not even believe when they want to do anti-apartheid to take their ass over there. In New York, they don't fuck with them. So somewhere in Philadelphia and Washington and Chicago, a flank going to have to go into New York to fuck with them because New York ain't going to fuck with them because they paid not to. You don't get paid in New York when you fuck with them. That's why I'm not on LIB. Check. Hey. Check. And I'll never be on the motherfucker either. And I don't give a fuck because you can see we don't need them to talk to each other. It's not even a debate with anyone outside our community. All this is for us. We're all that matters. You're the jury. They on trial. They in trouble. You not. Now, the NC says on page three of the February 8th, 1992, Financial Times, the ANC accepts as general policy that a future democratic state has an obligation to pay the foreign debts which were incurred by the president past regime. Now, in case you don't know, that means that everything that the clerk did, everything that Botha did, everything that Boyster did, and all the rest of them, that the next group in gonna pay all the debt. What was the debt for? To pay the fucking asses at Israeli government for the military equipment that they bought. Now, why would Mandela want to pay their stanky asses? In fact, Mandela need to take his ass back to jail. <laughs> you might not like that. You might not like that. You might not like that, but you ain't seeing it straight. Why are they holding murder over Winnie Mandela's head till they sign the fucking agreement? They ain't gonna let this sister free till he sign over the African souls. Them African souls been sold once, brother. You can't resell them. 
Now I'm telling you, because we're going to start some shit in Africa. Africa needs some uh, African and American help. Yes. This sister is leaving the country. I just saw Winnie Mandela in Los Angeles. How's she going to leave the country with a murder beef on her? She's been found guilty, y'all. What's the deal? How many years she going to go for she gets sentenced? To 96, 95, 98? Why are we still sleeping through the shit that the white boy pulling? Every time you pick up your tomorrow paper, count up them diamond sellers in your paper. Look at every white store in your neighborhood selling a diamond. That's who the fuck we after. And don't tell me you're going to free Africa when they're selling diamonds in your community. Because this shit don't match. It don't match. This ain't going to be fun tonight. It don't match. So they need some help because they done fucked up. It's over. I don't know who in here was in the anti-apartheid movement, but I would just go to tell you personally that the shit failed. And it failed because the ones who led it didn't have the courage to call the names of the ones that were doing it. Andy Young and Jesse Jackson and many of the other people, some of the people that people love, they not chasing no Oppenheimer family. Ain't no Oppenheimer getting chased. Ain't no diamond seller dying for what he did to kill our race. In fact, brother mentioned the syphilis experiment in Tuskegee. Every city I go in, I say, give me the name of a doctor who did the shit. See, the doctor could be at your hospital. You don't even know. And the first time ever, I gave the brother a fee tape. First time ever, I was just at Cincinnati Technical College last week. Brother stood up, had him a black book, opened up to that page and read the names of the doctors. He ain't never forgot, and he pledged his life to get them. Some of them are still working in other cities. But the point is, we all need to have known who they were, and we should make sure they ain't got a safe place to go. Because you can fuck us in one city and go to another city and do real good, because we don't keep score. Now, y'all want to have a revolution in Philadelphia? I'm just, yeah, yeah. Y'all? Look, let me tell you something. All the white man want to know when you walk out of here is you're going to take your ass back to work on Monday. That's all the fuck he want to know. If you walk up out of here and you take your ass back to work and do what you've been doing, he say, ah, fuck Coakley. Because then he know that it ain't changed your life. Somewhere the information will change your life. Somewhere out of all these people, 10, 15, 20 of you are going to go forward. You're going to drop what you're doing. And you're going to find out that you can live when you stand up to defend your people. You won't starve. You won't die. Won't nothing happen to you if you make that step. We need full-time liberation fighters to protect the race or our ass is out of here. Now, think about it. All of you can sit down with a piece of paper and take last week for an example. Add up Monday. How many hours did your race get? You had to sleep, you had to eat, you may have had to work, you may have had to go to school. When you added it up, of them 24 hours, did you give 12 hours and 30 minutes to protect the race? Probably not. In fact, there's no position for you to even be in called Freedom Fighter. There's no such spot. How come? If all of us in this room put a dollar up, or $10 up, or $1,000 was raised a month, for three months, one person could get free, and in three months, the second one could go over. But we ain't in no game call. Let's free the people. Everybody's in. You know, this white man is really bad, motherfucker. We better go on keep doing what we're doing. Whether you're in it or not, whether you're going to fight or not, there are people who are submerged at this moment, who are well, ready, willing, and able to defend the race under any circumstances, have thought well out the day when the lights went out well past it. I don't know what y'all thinking of in your meetings. I don't know what y'all do when y'all get together. But other people are getting together to see what circumstances would it take to even the score such that if we fought it out, those were the circumstances that we could win under. I remember when I was here last, we were at Temple University. It was all the 10 people there. Well, whatever. It didn't make any difference. When we left there that night, we went down by City Hall, looked at all that Ben Franklin shit. Then we walked across the street, thank you, sister. We walked across the street to that Masonic temple over there. Who the head of that Masonic temple? Give me the name of the white man head of that Masonic temple. 
Give me the name of the white man that has a Masonic temple right across from City Hall. Those are the Masons who are alleged to be the successors to the ancient Egyptians, Africans. These are the people who say they're going to succeed your black butts. Give me the name of the white man that run the temple. Okay, let's move on then. One of my friends went to the temple. Let me tell you what he took out of there. I have in my possession. About 10 or 12 of us, other of us have this. But every time we go in one of them temples while somebody's leading with the tour guide, another group is drifting off to the back, turning the handles on doors that don't look to be open, trying to pry open doors that look like they locked, trying to reach up under and look up under shit that ain't in the tour. And you know what we found in there? We found the yearbook to the Masons of all of South Africa. I have the name of every Mason in South Africa, the name of every lodge in South Africa, the history to every lodge and every Mason in South Africa, and we stole it out the Masonic Temple in Philadelphia. To this day, they ain't got the fucking book. Now, somebody may have to come in from Washington to handle the Masons in Philadelphia because the niggas in Philadelphia ain't fucking with them. Check. So while y'all in New York, we're going to bring someone in to cover y'all. <laughs> Check. All right, this is the real deal. See, somehow we ain't got no book. We ain't got no scorecard. We won't even clip the newspaper. Somebody tell you they junkie. You'd rather have a clean house and be your ass behind the fence. I'm just saying you somehow we ain't adding up. We're not squaring away these things with ourselves correctly. So if these Masons who wrote the Constitution, this is a book. They got it down at the House of the Mother Supreme down there in D.C. The Masons who helped shape the nation. And they got the Constitution right down there. Now I make this courtly impression to you. In jail of the black people, the predominantly black people in jail for conspiracy. Never for doing the shit, but for conspiring to do the shit. Now, what if we pulled the RICO shit on them? The RICO shit. Recover all your assets, jerk. RICO. What does a RICO mean? That all those who wrote this document, you see, if we're going to have a righteous revolution, a righteous revolution, you see, you have the right to overthrow all that's wrong, but you must be strong in your proving it's wrong because it ain't a country on this planet. If you had a righteous revolution, a provable righteous revolution, there's not one country on this planet that would not acknowledge it if it was righteously placed. See, we know how to take it, how to keep it is the equation. How do we keep the Germans or the French from flying over here trying to get the shit back for his white boy? So it must be some chemistry, some element that forces the other elements of the countries off of you. Now. When they came here, what was the law that they used to take the land? What law was that? There was no motherfucking law. They took the shit. That was the law. They took the shit. They took the shit. Now, now, we in a RICO case, y'all the grand jury. Check. I seek to indict the 56 signers of the Constitution because it is the unifying document that holds the 50 states together. And this, unified, this is the cornerstone to the unity of the white race in North America is the Constitution. So if you break the unity of the 50 snakes of America, you've got to bust the Constitution, which was written by Masons who called you three-fifths of a man, and in indicting them, are they or are they not racist? Check. Guilty or not guilty? Okay, now, if so, then we apply the RICO case to them, and we claim that anything, since this was a criminal enterprise, we claim that any financial gain that they have made since the writing of the Constitution is hereby claimed by us. Check. Because you see, every time you do some shit, and they say that was the shit that you did, they want to claim all the shit. We fighting for Yahweh being Yahweh. They got hotels everywhere, they fighting, buying stores and stuff. So they put the RICO on them, want to take all their stuff. So we put the RICO on their ass. Everything that they've gained since they came is claimed by all of us. The ones that they stole and the ones that they stole from. Check. And unless you come in this context, somebody can say you was breaking one of the white man's laws. I don't give a fuck about his law because we are claiming over his law. 
The claim over his law is he can't show one knowledge of any law that was in place when he showed up. And if he was a man of law, then he should have asked, what was the law when he got his ass to New York? What was the law when he brought his ass to Georgia? What was the law when he brought his ass to New England? And if he honored that law, then he has the right to keep what he got. But if he didn't, his ass, everything is ours. Jack. Now that's for the record. You have to sleep on that one. Because that's our claim, that those things belong to us. Now why would the Masonic yearbook of the South Africans be in Philadelphia? Check. That's your job. Y'all should go down there on that tour Monday. Y'all should be in there so much, they should see the same people every week. They should be tired of taking you around. They got tours. Walk around there. Keep your eye on them. Shoot the picture of every white boy coming out. Get a camera. I see plenty of cameras in here. Go on, stand there, everybody take a ship and shoot the pictures of every white man. Go in and out of that building for a week. They'll take the meeting someplace else. Chase them at that meeting. You don't even have to engage them. Just be right there. Let them see you. Put the, look at that, there's enough. Look, look, look at that. Fuck with their head, they fuck with yours. <laughs> enough of them to stop us, we stopping us. Ain't nobody holding you back. I always get that example about being there late at night when the damn little fucking ass light bulb with a red shield on it go red and motherfucker stop right at his feet. Ain't even a white man there. Ain't even a white man at the street sign to say stop. You just stop automatically. You've been trained to stop. That's right. Check. How come we don't meet at 3 a.m. in the morning when the police force is at this Lord's air? Brother mentioned something about the fire department. Don't you know that the National Fire Academy is in Emmitsburg, Maryland, on the grounds of FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency? Why is the National Fire Academy a part of FEMA? And as your local black firemen, what do they know about being used when it comes to incarcerate our race? Find out what role they got for the firemen. It's deeper than you think. Them trucks and them hoses are going to blow your ass right up in the fence. You better go to them. We just left me with some black firemen in L.A. We you let me with the black firemen in Cincinnati. Sit down with your black firemen and turn and tell them if you hear. If you look, if you see three, four white boys go in the room, pull out a map, talk, monitor that. If they go to the washroom, play like you pin, get your ass in there up on them. If we're going to walk around them, you better watch them, and if you watch them, report on them. Go take a little sheet of paper and give it to Dale Jones and put, this is what I learned from watching my white man this week. <laughs> And best get a report in there with your name on it, because when the new deal come down, you got to explain why you was there. And if you ain't got no report showing you was fucking them while you was there, you in trouble with us. <laughs> How many people in here informants? Raise your hand. All informants, raise your hand. Informants, government agents, spies, raise your hand. <laughs> now the reason I ask that, listen now, listen. Listen, when we go to talk about the boule, we're going to talk about the new Negro coming back, the Negro coming back. The white man is fucking with his own little Negroes, they working back. Now I want to tell you something. Every time there was a revolution, every time there was a revolution, the first thing the revolters did was went to the files to pull out the information of who was telling on the people when the last guy was winning. You see, if you're serving a white man now, I make this statement to you. I make the statement to you. If you're serving the white man now, you all right. You're doing good. And your good shit lasts as long as he winning. But when his ass lose, you ours. Now, in the process, in the transition, in the transition, there will be made a way for some of you to come back. I have always said, even when I call this boule, even when I talk about Jesse Jackson or, or Clarence Page or any of these other chumps, fake front Negroes that are using in our behalf, and sometimes they do some good shit, I give them good shit. Sometimes they do bad shit, I spank their ass. I try to be fair about it. <laughs> but I want to tell you, the goal is never to kill them. 
We have never wanted as a goal to have to kill the niggas in our community. We, we want to relieve them of the one that made a nigga out of them. And we have always just asked, I say to any of you, even who are working for him, because you got to be here, you ain't going to tell me all these people going to come together in Philadelphia over some name and the names of some white motherfuckers, and they ain't going to send nobody to come watch this shit. So I say this, that's all right if you watch it. Tell him half the story. If we say we going left, tell him we going right. He don't know. Now, in the transition, double agent his ass. If he got you telling, come tell us what he got you looking for. Ain't nobody gonna jump you. You need to know that we're more compassionate for you. Maybe you might not even deserve this compassion, but our love for you is still great. Somebody's tape went off. So we always will make a way for you to come back through the basement. And we are open to you. And we say, remember now, in Russia, you check this out now, I'm gonna show you this article. I was in, uh, where was I? I was in North Carolina when this came down. This was January 3rd, 1992. This is the uh, Herald Sun in Durham, North Carolina. It says, Germans flock to see secret files. Relatives, friends, were informants fold their shows. It says, risking friendships and even marriages, thousands of people applied Thursday to see their secret police files at the new commission that promises to reveal everything the hated force held on millions of East Germans. Who informed on me, or did anyone inform on me, were the questions as people flocked to the offices in Berlin and 14 other cities to see the files from the Stasi, S-T-A-S-I, of the East German secret police force. Stasi was known to use relatives, friends, co-workers as informants. When East Germany and West Germany united, the Stasi six million files were reorganized uh, uh, so that the people could reveal for the first time who it was that informed on them. In one particular case, a woman named Vera Wallenberger, once an East German opposition activist and now a member of the unified German parliament, learned that her husband, Knud, had informed on her activities. The disclosure shattered their family. Quote, I have my worst surprise behind me. Now, I make a point that that woman that was an activist went to read the files and found out her husband was the informant on her. Now, I want to tell you this thing about who do you trust. Don't trust nobody. Anybody with a body is vulnerable to error. Anybody with a body. How many of y'all in here got bodies? <laughs> so don't hang up about who all you trusted and how they fucked you up. Don't trust anybody, even yourself. Once you stop, once you operate from the full position of everybody could fuck you up someday, one way or another, then you will have a better way of dealing with the flexuality, flexuality in our personalities that make us good one day and bad another. So we have to have, because we're talking about trying to pull off a revolution, and we have to have an understanding of each other. Nobody is perfect. Therefore, you're trying to mix the best you can with each and every one of you to make a big group to go out and do something. So remember that if these Germans did it, then the Soviets did it, and if the Soviets did it, the Americans did it. They all are intelligence communities together. In fact, here's a story here from the Washington Post, Help Wanted, Bring Cloak Dagger. CIA Chief Bob Gates needs more spies stalking the New World Order. Yes, they have said that this New World Order, where we see they had a fight. They had a fight and all the white boys fought and the American white boy won. This beast right here, the Wicked Witch of the West, she won the fight amongst the white boys. And she won the fight amongst the white boys, and that makes her the baddest white boy on the planet. Now, because of that, they then become the pace setter. They set the agenda. They call the shot for the other white boys that tow it all in one line. This is the Washington Post, February 9th, 1992. It says, it says here, as the leader of the world's biggest intelligence community, Robert Gates is the de facto leader of all other Western spy chiefs. It is clear from interviews with other intelligence heads in the past two weeks that where Gates goes, the rest will follow. 
His battles will be their battles. His victories will help ensure their survivals. I make a point to you that there has been behind the scenes in the unity of all of the intelligence systems under the U.S. intelligence system. They're now one big white organization. Now, further it says is that because of the New World Order gates and espionage chiefs of most Western powers agree that the New World Order calls for more spies, not fewer. In fact, Gates is leading the charge to put more fedoras and raincoats into circulation in global dark alleys. And Congress is responding, giving him more than 15, 50 million above what he asked for. Human, H-U-M-I-N-T, Human Intelligence Program, a word slightly sinister, means like 007. The word of the dead letter drops, brush passes, and micro dots hasn't departed after all. To be sure, Gates has vowed to reorganize all vast intelligence apparatus on the world's remaining superpower to ready it for the demands of the 21st century. Well, who do you think they're after? <laughs> sure. Here's one. I did this one in New York. I know many of y'all seen that slave theater videotape. Uh, it's one up here where Baker meets with the KGB, and the word is, who's our enemy now? And that's a heavy, that's a heavy statement. Who's our enemy now? Who do you think it is? We are. Yeah. And if it's us, then what do they think they're going to do? What do they want with us? Uh, what's the name of the guy that heads the United Nations? Oh, stand up. Somebody over here, holler out. What's the name? Come on up there, brother. You're getting a free tape. Come on. We got a role for spiritual education. I give him a free tape because, really, some people call out the quail. He the last guy. He the last guy. I got a new guy now from Egypt. My point of it is, is that the United Nations is the engineer of the New World Order. It's their responsibility to kick the ass in the future. Now, in the Persian Gulf War, I know I have three six tape sets over there from three lectures I gave at Howard on the Persian Gulf War. A lot of shit happened then that slipped past us we may not have seen. My point to it is, is that during that time, the United Nations emerged as the one that could declare that another country could get its ass kicked. It's called the right to use force on it. And Bush got that to pass the UN. Now I was just in Kentucky, at North Kentucky State. Did a TV show there with a professor on the campus after we lectured. And a little Asian guy was the cameraman. And after I got through talking about the United Nations and I said, don't bring no Chinese and don't bring no Soviet motherfucker in the black community talking about liberation. Fuck both of them. Now why you will fuck both of them is because either one of them could have stopped the bombing in Iraq. Now it ain't like we got no money from our rocks, so fuck that too. Fuck Kuwait, fuck Saudi, fuck all of that. Ain't none of them in our neighborhood. Check. How many of y'all in here get money from any of them? So fuck them, right? Any black person die for that shit is a dishonor to our race. Check. Right. Now, so we ain't gonna get hung up on that shit. And we gotta quit getting hung up on shit that ain't on record for doing shit for us. Now. Now, at the, the little Chinese dude, he told me, he said, no, no, China abstain, China abstain. UN rules say when China abstain, U.S. no bomb. I said, look, motherfucker, they already bombed their ass. What you talking about, no bomb? His point was that he say that China abstain, he's Asian. Now, he want to be up for the Asian thing. When I was in Minnesota, they sent an Asian reporter out. He accused me of anti-Semitism. When I did the lecture, I had him stand up and say, tell the people what anti-Semitism is. He didn't know, but he accused me of it. <laughs> but when he did his story, he accused me of fronting off Asians. But he flunk in for Jewish people, right? But the check, that's check, not right, check. So the point of it is, is that the Asian little guy that was there, the cameraman, he gonna tell me, China cool, China cool. I said, China cut a deal with this whole called America. China a whole. Russia a whole, and they want that big white money. 
So they got on their knees and they opened up their countries and China allowed the Americans to dictate to them that they would only have one baby because too many hungry Chinese America can't feed them all. Check. Now, with the Soviet thing, there's a whole lot of our people bringing that Soviet shit in the community. Talking about some of them ism and shit. I don't know which of the ism shit work, but if you don't control it, it's more than likely no ism gonna help you. If you control the shit, it's controlism. That's the shit that works. And you do then whatever you need to do to make it work right. It ain't got no philosophical line. What philosophical line builds a toilet and make the shit go away and you don't see it again? Now I'm telling you that if you ran a country, you better be prepared to pave the streets of, of Philadelphia. You better be prepared to fix the light bulbs. You better be prepared to turn the electricity on and turn it off. Put the water in. We don't drink the water no way, right? Don't drink no faucet water. Check. Okay. Watch them too, sister. If they drink the water, let me know. Because they're going to get the acting all crazy and shit. Now. This happened in February for Black History Month, February 1st, Saturday. LA Times, I was in LA then. World leaders urge UN to safeguard rights everywhere. They had the first Security Council Summit in the history of the UN. Now the UN was started in 44, 45, somewhere in there, built, owned, and controlled still by the Rockefeller family, right? But don't wake them up in New York, they ain't never in the history of New York had an anti-Rockefeller demonstration. That's some shocking shit. So we got people got to come in from other places to go into New York to hound that Rockefeller ass because the people in New York don't fuck with Rockefeller. But they fuck with each other all day long. They beat the shit out of each other. But they ain't going to go fuck with no Rockefeller. They know not to fuck with a Rockefeller, but we got to fuck with the Rockefeller. We got to fuck with him. You ain't gonna win unless you fuck with him. He is the wizard of the American eyes. We must go see his ass. Now next time y'all see me, this next set of lectures that come from me gonna be on the families. The first one gonna be on the Rockefeller family. When I come back here, the lecture gonna be on the Rockefellers. Fuck them or die. That's what it's gonna be called. Fuck them or die. And I ain't going nowhere. The world leaders meeting in the first Security Council summit in history pressed the United Nations to abandon its tradition of non-interference in the internal affairs of countries. Now, what do, you, what do that mean? That means that the United Nations, in what I call the Supreme Security Council meeting, said that the next move is that we want the right to fuck with any country. We don't care what their law is. We want to do what we did when we found the Indios. Now that's why I give the brother the tape that know his name, because you better be prepared to fuck up whoever run the United Nations that allows some shit like that to go down. And with all them black people in New York, why we got a problem with the United Nations? When they all got to walk past the black people to get their ass in the door. If we just turned around, we got them surrounded. <laughs> Check. Check. IMF, World Bank, fuck the black people every day. If the people in D.C. had enough and want to help Africa, all they got to do is go down to 19th Street and kick some ass. Them motherfuckers do not like personal pressure. When I call in from that... Uh, way up in them hills of Pennsylvania, calling into a radio show in Chicago, put six dollars in the phone, and I told that white man, he was talking about Mike Tyson, call him gorilla, monkey, animal, eat the food, nigga, he called him out. I said, look, white man, we may be out in front of that studio tonight. We just sit up and listen to you, and we wait, no, we gonna kick your ass one day soon. The white boy's whole dialogue for the rest of the night changed when he felt like somebody would fuck with him if he kept acting up. Now I'm trying to tell you the formula to getting the white people off your ass is to put them in the position of saying you will fuck them up if they mess up because unless you do, they're going to keep fucking you. I'm, I mean, this don't sound pretty and there's a lot of cuss in there. I say, this motherfucker he cuss all night long. Well, fuck it. Somebody else didn't cuss all night long, didn't taste shit. And you know what? Sometimes we got to talk to each other like this. I, I, let me take that back. I'm not going to qualify cussing and talking nasty or saying anything 
Sometimes this be funny, some, it really ain't funny. Sometimes I have to say silly shit to entertain myself, having said it a thousand times to people that swear they on the case. When you really look at the case, you know they ain't. And so I, it, I have to entertain myself to make up for the gap between what you say and what you do. I just, just it hurts me that bad. So it, I had to do silly shit up here to entertain myself, but it ain't really funny at all. It really ain't. And it ain't really nice to have to sit here and look like the Slasher and, the, and Freddy Krueger and shit scratching everybody up there with scissor hand or some old shit trying to cut some consciousness into our people's ass. Why don't we react when we under attack? Hey, look here. Look here. Who run FEMA in, who run FEMA in this area? Who run FEMA in Philadelphia? Who run the Office of Emergency Preparedness for the city of Philadelphia? That's the municipal component to FEMA. Who? All Schlitt. All Schaefer. He the fire commissioner. He run the office of a... Who the city manager? Shipman. Keep your eye on his ass. Find out where he live, and when he start leaving his home at funny hours, follow him. See, when I read the name of the boule and I give you the address on the meet on the day they had a meeting, follow their ass because we want to go to the meeting one day. Check. Because, see, when we start saying we're going to the meeting, if Rhodes and Rothschild got a secret society and they got a meeting, we need to go to the meeting. If the Mason boys having a big meeting down there next to City Hall, we need to go to the meeting. Let them motherfuckers tell us we can't come in. Let us all get to the door, three, four hundred thousand of us, or two, three hundred of us, twenty of us at the door. Let them tell us we can't come in. Peep around, shoot the camera over somebody's shoulder while they're holding the door open and get the pictures. And show the pictures at the next Copley lecture. Okay. Now, here's a story. Here's a story here talking about one Europe. This is the LA Times, February 4th, 92. One Europe, a dream, the dream of unity. A divided continent sees shared destiny. The breeding ground of two world wars is trying to erase old boundaries. Up to 30 nations hope to meld into history's largest voluntary confederation. I don't know if you can see that there on the tape. I'm gonna show it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking at the monitor. You, you show his ugly, Coakley. I see it's hard to get the light on it. But I want you to, if you could see the little people there with erasers standing there in front of the countries wiping away the borders. And the point to it is, is to show that there's unity of the white race in the caves of Europe. And that these caves of Europe always had different entranceways. And when you went to the back of the cave, you had to go all the way out to the front and out of France and into Britain, and then you go all the way. Now they put a hole in the back of the cave so you don't have to walk out the cave. You can just go from room to room without having to come out each time. And that's what the unifying of those borders are doing for the Europeans. And my point to it is, is that once they have unified, we have what we call coming together of the three cluster theory. The three cluster theory is that the United States, Western Europe, and Japan became the engineers of the New World Order and everyone else, like the Soviets, the white Soviets got to go with the European section and the Asian Soviets got to go with the Japanese section. The Malaysia, the Taiwan, the Hong Kong, the Singapore, they go with Japan. The Canada, the Mexico, free trade agreements going on now. South America, OAS, they just took when the dude from Haiti got busted. They, he ran, how a black man gonna run to Washington, D.C.? In fact, Sister and I just looked at the OAS yesterday. Huge building right next to the White House. Organization of American States, founded in 46 by Rockefeller too. And when Rockefeller set it up, he's the chairman emeritus of it now, but when the guy from Haiti lost his country, it was there that he went to go to appeal to get it back. Who is the fucking a OAS? And what do they have to do with the islands and the Caribbean and Cuba and other things that we're concerned about? Who runs that and why don't we know about them if we want to save our brown brothers and sisters? That, that thing running around here from Brazil with the booties on it, what's that play called? Obo Dobo? What's the play called with the booties running around everywhere? Right now, there's black people all up in there, right? 
Now, if you went down to Brazil and all them other, you'll find a whole bunch of your people. They need your help. But the country, the institution that runs them is in Washington, D.C., where the black people got it surrounded if they knew what it was. How come we don't focus on, if the U.N. is going to kick ass with no law, how come we don't know a go there to kick that ass? How far is New York from here? Well, look, we're going to have to take one day, through, Monday through Friday. I ain't for that Saturday and Sunday shit. Like the day in D.C., Jesse Jackson had hands around Washington. Well, always everybody walk when everybody off of work. Let's walk when they're working. See, we need to do our shit Monday through Friday from 9 to 5. Because that's the ones we want to catch. Ain't no need us coming on the weekend when they safe at home. Check. So we all need to get together one Monday through Friday and take our ass up to the United Nations and rove around. Check. Double check. And how come everybody in the world want to go there and meet somebody from all them countries, but the people in New York don't even go down and see nobody? We close by here in Philadelphia, run up there. Every single country is there. You can go and talk to somebody from everywhere in the world. I ain't for the institution. When we win, it's down, it's out. It, there'll be no more. There'll be no more city called Philadelphia. Check. Check. What y'all gonna name it? <laughs> At least y'all did stop that Columbus thing. Wasn't that up in here? Y'all stop Columbus Street? <laughs> Get the shit anyway? From Delaware to Columbus. Well, what do that mean? What do you think that mean? Thank you. Well, we say don't count in day war. So we got to make on with our own. That's why we got to have our own. Because that'll work. That other shit won't work. The G7. Keep up with the G7. Keep up with the G7 because that's the economic arm to the New World Order. They ain't running the money through the UN. Only the IMF and the World Bank gonna work through the UN. But the G7 gonna handle the financial float of the money. How much is each money worth? How much gold worth? How much silver worth? That's the G7. Now the G7, one week before that Supreme Security Council meeting, they had a big meeting in New York. Now, how many of y'all been to the G7 meeting before? But we need to take our ass to a G7 meeting. We need to find where these white boys with the money meet, and we need to go to the meeting and check them out. What time is it? Somebody tell me what time it is. It's Boulay time. Everybody say, turn me Right, right, fuck y'all. Because see, y'all will get off the white man in two minutes. Y'all want the niggas, don't you? You want the niggas, don't you? I know how bad you want a nigga. That's what a slave do. He beat the other slave. Beat the shit out of him. Everywhere I go, y'all do the same shit. Give me the nigga. Give me... Fuck you, get the white man first. Prove you deserve the nigga. Now, get the nigga, get the nigga. You've been trained to get the nigga. Get the white man, y'all. Quit acting like a nigga. Hey, Michelangelo went off March 3rd, March 6th was the date that Michelangelo went off. Who was Michelangelo? He painted all of Jesus' white. He's the motherfucker that changed the thing, right? Now they had a virus called Michelangelo. We've been bit by this thing a long time. But he came on March 6th, the third month, the sixth day. Three sixes. And he arrived to let each and every one of know, the rest of them, that he was here, and he's the one that went from black to white. Check. So we be aware that they up to something. We ain't quite got it all figured out yet, but it's coded, it's coded in satanic language. Uh, I know all of y'all can't see this when I show up, but you know every time I go around, I see a lot of these white restaurants, and they got the new eating cuisine. This is the, you ever seen them T got TV show coming up? Y'all see, y'all, can y'all see that cover? Who that? That's Dalman. This motherfucker was eating people. Now, at what point are we in when the white man started eating people? Right? What was the film that won all the Academy Awards? What did the motherfucker do? Well, why you think the white man playing up eating people? People? You sweet, black meat. Okay, you might not believe it. They, they took your children and they cut them up in Atlanta to find that they were extraordinary. What make you think they ain't gonna eat your ass when they get hungry? 
check. Double check. They'll eat your ass when they get ready. Hey, now check this out. I want to show y'all something. Y'all remember, y'all remember this cover here? Was Cleopatra Black? Y'all remember that? Now we saw that, we might not know what they was doing, but when we put the whole picture together, we got a better idea of what they were up to. Now when we saw this, that was the first time ever I saw red, black, and green three million times on anything. Because that's how many of these they sell a week all over the world. Three million of them, right? And, and, and probably even more than that. Uh, it says, fact or fantasy, a debate rages over what to teach about our kids and their roots. Now, there was some fucked up shit in the article. Some of the shit come from here. And I'm going to tell you, I ain't for adding no page called Afrocentrism to no white man book. If the book is wrong, fuck the whole book, we don't want a chapter. So don't get caught trying to sell a white man a chapter talking about you adding the black thing. The black thing will only live when the white thing is dead. Now, and I don't care if it's Temple or Harvard, this shit don't add up either way it go. The same week that this one was out, this one was out, but it was a little less talked about. This one is called Lost Tribes, Lost Knowledge, about how when you kill a race of people, you kill off their knowledge. And this was dated September 23rd, 1991, just like this one was. Now, I'm suspicious. When the white man take his main weekly magazines and on his cover put the black thing, that don't sit right with me, because I know he ain't out trying to find Cleopatra and give to her what he stole. Now, one week before that, cameraman right here went down to U.S. News and World Report and posed for this picture. Now, I don't know if y'all can see it. It say, early man. The radical new view of where we came from. That's the cameraman. Did you, you, how much they pay you for posing for this, bro? That look just like you. Early man. The radical new view of where we came from. That looked like black man. But why is it, this is one week before the other two, why is the white man on two-week basis telling all of his white friends, hey, you better watch that black thing, it's the original thing. Now I wanna make a proposition to you. That's uh, one week before September 20, that's uh, to be exact, September 16th. The other two were September 23rd. Y'all remember this one, the search for Adam and Eve by Lucy? How many black women in here named Lucy? So how come when you find out we was first, you give us a name we ain't never took? Y'all remember this one, Who Are We? About the Columbus and all the shit they stole. They confess to the shit they took. Where that other one? I got another one up here you're going to like. This is deep. For Black History Month, how many of y'all saw this? You got it? How many of y'all got this? Now see, this is in ice language. It's hard to see. See, you be walking past the news thing. See, see, we like color shit, right? We like st shit stand out and stuff, right? So if we walk past this, we don't really see it. It's written in ice language, right? It's like some cave shit. It was just cut out of ice. So we didn't see a lot of this, right? It say white people. This is the February issue of Esquire magazine. The February issue of Esquire magazine. Now you need to buy the tape. I can't be giving you no free tape tonight. You got to see Dale Jones to buy the tape. <laughs> that was this Black History Month, white people. But I want you to come up and holler out, because somebody got to help me. I can't read. Brother, come up here and tell me, what do it say in little bitty print? This print is so small you can't see it. What do that say? Say it in the microphone. The trouble with America. Read it all over. White people, the trouble with America. <laughs> now, why would a whole white magazine, I was a 16 page piece condemning me in this magazine, May of 89, done by that white boy, Taylor Branch, who did Part in the Waters. And he is a known CIA agent. And when he come to me and say, tell me where you're speaking, and I said, I don't tell white boys where I'm going before I get there. He wrote in the thing, coakly lonely and desolate and pre-suicidal. <laughs> That's because
because if he told the white boy that I told him I don't tell white boys where I go, he wouldn't have got paid. See, they sent him because nigga just talked to anybody. Yeah, where you, where, where you going to be? Oh, here, white man, I tell you. What you going to do next? Oh, here, white man, fuck them, don't tell them shit. <laughs> now, listen up, listen up. White people, the trouble with America. Now, this is coming around that other stuff. Why you think they confessing like this? See, in the last days, they got to fess up. They need the other white people to do what they demand for them to do, and they want the poor white to come and kill you. They want to offer. Watch it, it just happened last week. The Pentagon came out with the revised guard and reserve list, and all the blacks who were in the guard and all the blacks who were in the reserve that know Brother Coakley, who would never come and move on the race, are all being told they fired. Check. Because the laws for FEMA say that the provision allows you to develop a 20,000 force militia when your guard and your reserve ain't on duty. Therefore, when you suspend the brother move, you bring the 20,000 back together and they're all white. And the articles were telling the white people you see, in Chicago, little white kids are wearing 23, running around jamming basketball rims, wanting to be like Michael Jordan. The little white kids dance a little better than they danced before because they, you know, when I was little, they used to have an American bandstand, and they used to be there doing all this shit. <laughs> they was doing all that goofy shit, right? They don't do like that no more. They be doing shit looking like your stuff. <clears throat> and you know, they singing like you and they dread, they, I seen white boy in red, black and green hat. Red, black and green jackets. Got that cross current shit that they're stealing the black stuff. JC Penney's in the white store selling the kente, selling out. The white man has figured out that he's in a jam, and when he asked the poor black to come and kill you, the poor black kind of figure out that you ain't quite maybe his problem, therefore he lacks the desire to kill you, and that's a danger for the Rockefellers and the others who will need the poor white to fuck you. In Los Angeles, some brothers went and got some poor whites and tried to bring them in the black community for a meeting, and the liberal Jewish community busted the meeting up because they never want the poor white to weasel over with the poor black and agree not to kill each other because we ain't the ones in charge of shit, neither one of us. Now, I ain't for them in the army. I ain't for them in the community. If a white love us, let him watch the perpetrators. The victims got too much help already. Check. Okay, so we keep that in context. Now check this out. I just spoke before the Nation of Islam in Pasadena. At the lecture, I had just been in Long Beach. Sister came to the lecture and brought this magazine from, she works in the trade industry, it's called Advertising Age. This is the December 16th, 1991 issue of Advertising Age, and it goes to all the PR people, and this is a predominantly white magazine. This is for trade industry people, about contracts and other things. It does not make the mass market. But in it was an ad from Time Magazine to the white advertisers who advertise in it. You remember this cover? You might not see it that clearly. The Browning of America, you remember that cover? Where it said that by 2056, the white man will be a minority? Well, see, they never thought that we'd see this or the niggas that did see it weren't looking or caring. So Time Magazine wrote this in their ad. Come here, bro, you got a good, strong voice. I want you to read this to the people. Read this, what it says right here underneath here on, in the ad. It's in bold black letters. It says, hey, whitey, your turn at the back of the bus. Sometime soon, white Americans will become a distinct minority and largely brown, cultural, and racially mixed, and racially mixed. A hard story for many of our readers, but time has never tried to be easy. It's what our readers expect. 
They are willing to pay more for it and spend more time with it, which makes time a perfect place for your client's messages, cop, comprende. Hmm. You hear what Tom said? Tom said, hey, Whitey, your turn at the back of the bus. This is to other white people. Now, I'm telling you that time is thrown up amongst the other whites. We better kick the nigga ass now. A oh, nigga gonna get us. Time is the loose family, skull and bones bred from 1910 on. They was in on the killing of John Kennedy. That's a white thing. Oh, Time Warner, but Warner come in with Time, they really two corporations meshed into one. Now they just had a little fight. One half did the JFK thing and the other half was covering it up. So you got these corporations merging with competing interests under one house. In fact, the white people are suffering from the Tower of Babel dilemma. Look at them white Zionists and white Anglo-Saxon Protestants fighting it out. I love that shit. I love it when Sununu is fighting the Jewish people and the Jewish people fighting Sununu and Bush and Baker are fighting the is it reallys and the is it reallys fighting Bush and Baker. I like that shit. And you need to go to your white friends that are non-Jewish and say, don't let them Jewish people do that to you. And you go to any, I know you ain't got no Jewish friends, but go to any of them and, and any of them say, hey, don't let them white boys do that to you. And let them get worked up and mad at each other and bite at each other and fight each other. Propagate and magnify anytime you see to your own race of people when whites can't get along because we think they all together and they ain't them greedy bastards can't even sleep with each other right. They can't treat their wife right. Now, in this picture are all black babies except for the last baby is white. Now, the brown babies, they're black babies, and all those babies are laying there, and one last little baby is white. To tell the white, you'll be the last one on earth if you don't kick some ass now. Now, I'm telling you that in hindsight, those headlines were about building up the energy in the poor white to kill the black if for no other reason than that they could never be the chosen people as long as you're around. Oh, you ain't got to clap for that. That ain't about clapping. Now, let me say this here. God, y'all just left Cincinnati. Need some uh, tissue. Just every time I talk, and y'all heard them tapes, I, that white supremacy builds up in my nose. <laughs> See, it's healthy, it's clogged up in there, and not till I do good work do it come out. So every time I do good work, I get relieved of the white supremacy that's hidden deep in my head. Check, all y'all blow your noses. I'm so much better off for it. Yeah. Y'all better shit at least once a day, too. Because that shit stay on you two days, you're you in bad shape. That ain't supposed to happen like that. If you lay an apple out and you see it rot, if the shit sit in your belly two, three days, it'd be worse than it looks sitting on the table getting brown. So get that in and get that shit out. Check. Because a revolution got to be healthy people. Can't have no two, three day shit sitting in your belly. Don't have no revolution. The Cincinnati Enquirer, March 12, 1992. Ex-CIA boss warns of terrorism, social ills. If you check, all around the country, they busting into the little welfare thing. Now, they ain't letting 83,000 people off welfare in Michigan and 50,000 in Maryland and 100,000 in Ohio unless they set up the provision to watch all those people when they got taken off the money. So the intelligence community is greater now watching a poor set of our race, unplugging them from the money, preparing to kill them, but containing them and unplugging them in a way to assure, and here's the formula, every time the black people get hurt, Jesse Jackson fly in, he had a march. And he walk them till they tired. He look at them and say, y'all tired yet? They say, yes, we tired. As soon as they good and tired, he fly out and they go home. Every city, check it out, every city. Same formula. If it ain't that, then it's sharp, then he come in, he take them down another street. Right, depending on what your flavor is. 
Now, I can like either or the brothers at any given time, but I'm tired of seeing the people ventilated. Ventilated, where the air is let out of their bag, walked into irrelevancy so that there's no harm ever caused to the ones in control. What William Colby is saying at this lecture in Michigan, in, uh, in uh, Cincinnati, is that terrorism is going to come from the poor people who are now socially ill. So as we unplug them from the system, they are the ones who we got to fight since there ain't no more white boys left. And I make a suggestion to you, if you listen to that FEMA tape, that FEMA Western region, about the use of that militia and the cut back into that welfare thing and the anti-crime stuff. In D.C., the little white boy that ran the house bank shot himself in the mouth. Shot himself through his own mouth, and the next day the D.C. City Council ruled that a black man arrested could get in jail without being arraigned or offered bail or bond in response to the white boy trying to save his job at the house bank. My point to it is, is that under the guise of fighting crime, some things have creeped up on us. In Washington, D.C., the FBI into the major cities was first done in Washington, D.C. under Sharon Pratt Kelly, who was there because they couldn't trust Marion Barry to do it. So they got her to do it, and when she won the election there, she won the all-white ward, she won the, the rich, mixed, white and black ward, and the rich black ward, and she didn't win the other. Them the only ones voted for her, but in an eight, nine person race, that's all she needed to be mayor. And once she became mayor, she then announced an anti-crime program, and the 14th point of the anti-crime program is to immunize all children by the age of two. Here it is right here, Dixon offers 20 million plan to save trouble, to save the troubled and punish the troublemakers. This is, uh, this is uh, uh, Washington Post, November 27th, 1991. The 14th point of her program is immunize every two-year-old in the city. What does an anti-crime program have to do with immunizing a two-year-old child, Africans? Huh? It's something in it. In fact, I don't know if Jack mentioned it, but I hope y'all saw that Rock magazine. That's uh, March, uh, Cincinnati is March 12, 1992, Cincinnati Inquirer. That's the main paper in Cincinnati. Which is, how many of y'all seen this Rock magazine, Rolling Stone? It's a cave magazine. Play rock music in it. Y'all see this issue? The March 19th, 1992 issue? Y'all see that? called the origin of AIDS? Look at that black baby's mouth wide open with that white man's utensil going in that black baby's mouth. Y'all see that? It says the origin of AIDS and it got a bunch of Jewish doctors in here saying no comment, no comment, no comment. I don't know if that polio and smallpox was uh, laced with uh, the AIDS virus. It may have been, I don't check it. You see that black baby? with that mouth open and the hand. And look at this picture here. Look at this one white man standing in the middle of all them black people. You might not see that that well. Handing out injections in an all African village. And you need to see this. This is Rolling Stones, March 19th, 1992. And my point to that is, is that somewhere it's an injection thing going on. Now I would like Brother Jack. You know why I like Brother Jack? Because there are not a lot of biochemists and technical medical people who broke away from the white man and came back to us and spoke to us in any form or any fashion. I love you, Jack. Where you at, Brother Jack? You in here? Where you at, Brother Jack? Hey, brother, let's give Judge Jack another hand. Because, you see, he needs to have a laboratory and we need to pay for it. We do. It needs to happen. Look at the Magic Johnson situation. I want to tell you for a fact, and Brother Jack, I, I say this, I state this publicly, that when they announced that Magic Johnson had a virus that brings on AIDS, that there were at least five or 10,000 black people that day that were so depressed and so hurt 
that they lost the will to fight the virus and the virus got their ass in the depression. You see, your mind has a lot to do about the willingness of your body to let a virus penetrate the living parts of your cell. And so when you announce a $25 million a year black man is on AZT, which kills all of your cells, not just the bad part, it kills the good part too. That's controlled death. Now, if you got a black man with 25 million in his pocket, can fly anywhere on the planet to get a remedy, and you got a nigga to stand up and say, I got it, I quit, I'm on AZT, you got you a real fool. But, but, everywhere in the country, when it was announced that Magic had this virus, everybody called everybody to see if somebody could get to him and give him some Kimron or Emerex. Everybody, all over, how many calls I had, how many times we tried to trap this nigga. You see, before he had the problem, in LA you could find him at the basketball court in the community, he was readily accessible to everyone. But as soon as they announced he had it, you couldn't find him. But them Jewish boys was out speaking for him. And they give him the shit remedy that'll kill him and the whites do not want him to announce, I'm doing fine, I'm on the black thing. What would it do to what he has planned if he got well on the black thing and everybody know his name? <laughs> Let me tell you, in Washington, D.C., we know he got it. The brothers caught him, Dr. Aleem's aide, caught him in Washington, D.C., and put the Kimron in his hand. A Couple of days later, he announced to the whites that he wanted to come back. The whites said, no, nigga, we don't want you. And he has said again and again, I want to come back now. And the whites are too far over the line to let him back. Couple of little side bits. A little mysterious in the beginning about how he got it. Didn't come out until after the press conference that it was heterosexual, but the prostitute that they alleged gave it to him, who was fingered in the media in LA, took the test and didn't have it. And she got in them little uh, stars and inquires and said, don't stop doing business with me. I ain't got the shit. She said, y'all ain't fucking up my business. And if she didn't give it to him, where did he get it? And why was he having all those tests and it never showed up? And what is it about this moment in life before you attack the black people that you bust down their heroes? Y'all ever remember that movie Rollerball? When Jonathan got too big for the game and he really wasn't waking nobody up, but all of the people liked him and it made the white man vulnerable to an extraordinary personality that only played sports. But the white boys called him in and said, Jonathan, you have to announce your retirement. And Jonathan said, what the fuck? I'm at the height of my game. What do you mean? He said, Jonathan, we spent a lot of years getting control of this shit. We're not gonna let no sports hero playing no fucking game ignite and electrify the people and organize against us even if you don't even understand yet you're still a danger in fact magic you're somewhat charismatic michael you're somewhat charismatic mike yeah you got an overactive sex appetite but the little street people love you mike and we don't like that right now we're about to kill the black people. No heroes allowed. Check. <laughs> so they told the brother he had to go. Michael Jordan ended up the first host of Saturday Night Live, cooking pork, playing a wig, playing, it was the first black globe trotter. Y'all see that first Saturday Night Live when they had uh, Public Enemy, Spike Lee, Jesse Jackson, and Michael Jordan as the host in the first. That's more blacks than they have on all year. Had them on one show. 
but they dehumanized Michael Jordan on that show. They dehumanized him. Now, let me do this here, because I see Dell that showed up. Now, Dell is ugly as I am, right? <laughs> but let me tell you something. I want to tell you something about Dell. I want to thank him in front of all of you, but it's not for what you think. Dale went down to Washington, D.C. to give a speech. I ain't even going to get into nobody's names because I'm not going to use any opportunity I have to take advantage of them. But Dale was down speaking in another city, and a bunch of people stood up. When he quoted me in his lecture and said, you should never quote this Coakley. He's a terrible dude. He's, he's they're all kind of agents. He's the government. He's every motherfucking thing you can stand up. And a sister walked up to me yesterday who he doesn't know, who I didn't know and told me about this brother being attacked in another man's house over Steve Copley and how he stood tall for 45 minutes and fought their asses back. Dale picked up the phone and called me in Los Angeles after that meeting and we talked and he couldn't believe it. And I made a point of saying to the brother that I appreciate what he did because you see, once you start doing a certain set of something, Somebody who probably more than likely ain't even going to see it this way going to come behind you and come up with some reason about why it ain't so. That's why I bring all these good white materials so you can follow the information yourself and don't get hung up in my personality. Don't get hung I'm, I'm incidental to this thing. But I just want to thank this brother for standing up and defending my name when I wasn't there with a group of people who the tide didn't turned on them now. But the point to it is, is that the revolution is wherever you stand in, at any moment you hear anything that don't go down right, you're on the front line and you've got to respond. And may not be nobody looking. Nobody may ever know that you did it. But just go ahead and do it, because if everybody just goes ahead and does that little part, we okay. Now, let me do something real quick. I got to hook something up to hook you into this boule. I want to read you these names. I want you to holler out to me who these people are. When I talk about secret societies, I had a Rhodes Rothschild, them the ones at the top. They own the countries. Now see, this is why we got to come back, because I got so many things up here I didn't get to. We're going to come back sometime soon, probably sometime in May. I know I, I got to take a week off and run around the country with my children and teach them some things, and we'll be back. We'll be loose again sometime in May. And, and, uh, Rhodes Rothschild at the top. The Masons, the Skull and Bones, and the Boule are operators. See, Carter was October surprise. He had one million. Reagan was shot in the belly. He had one million. Uh, Nixon was Watergated. He had one million. Look at this motherfucker Nixon. His ass still around telling motherfuckers what to do. He didn't rose from the dead, fucked up the money, fucked up the country, prosecuted, convicted, I his ass out on the street telling Buchanan and Bush what to do, meeting with the Soviets and all that. Look better than he looked 20 years ago. Now what the fuck? Now, John Kennedy had 400 million. They shot the fuck out of him. The rest of them, they just kind of moved him out because they threatened him with economic sanctions. And to beat the economic sanctions, they all behaved. But they had to shoot the Kennedy boy because he had so much money, he didn't need the one million. They shot his brother because he too had 400 million. Got a tape over there on coup d'etat. Need to study them assassinations. Very important. It has always been the bullet, never the ballot. Now, the boule. Two things I need to do, and you want this in your tape because we want the people to get this tape from Brother Dell. And the boule is the black male secret society started in 1904 where? Chat. Now, why was it here? <laughs> well, I'm going to make sure that sometime soon I can copy this up and leave a copy of this with Brother Dell. This is the book, The History of the Sigma Pi Phi. And in it is the history of the Boule and the first meeting of the founding members here in Philadelphia. And it mentions who those founding members were and a little bit about Philadelphia at the time that the boule was started. Mentions a number of Negroes and different jobs and different professions and the type of things that they did. Said, for example, page 18, the census of 1900 had its parallel in several cities of the north and border states. One of them was Philadelphia. 
This city ranked high in the list of those giving work opportunities to the Negro population, many of whom were industrious and frugal and manifested patient fortitude in their face of strong opposition and prejudice. Some owned real estate of considerable value and were engaged in profitable business enterprises while others were in professional activities. This advanced status of the Negro population was due partly to the location of the state of Pennsylvania, which was the first of the states to adopt an emancipation and devote its legislation to freedom. Mm. <laughs> its major city, Philadelphia, was known as the city of brotherly love, which is a Masonic word, brotherly love. That's part of their creed, brotherly love. That's a Masonic phrase. That's the only place you can find it ever coming from. Brotherly love, that's what two Masons say when they see each other on the way. The proportion of free colored people in Philadelphia before the Civil War was greater than in any other city in the North. While there was prejudice and exclusion, the history of the Negro in Philadelphia was a reflection of, of his background and particularly of his relation to particular occupations. There were between 1870 and 1896 more than 1,500 Negroes who migrated from southern states to Philadelphia. By 1880, there were 39,371 Negroes in this city, and they comprised 3.8% of the total population. In 1900, there was a single ward of Philadelphia, seven teachers, five lawyers, six physicians, 22 clergymen, three dentists. It says, of the prosperous businesses in this city was the catering business. There were very few cities in the United States in which there were more successful and efficient Negro caterers than in Philadelphia. Among others of this group was Henry Minton, an uncle of Henry M. Minton, who was located in his business in the downtown section at 4th and Chestnut Streets and later at 12th and Walnut Street. Y'all know what that is? In describing this part of Negro Philadelphia during the last decade of the 19th century, Du Bois stated in his study, The Philadelphia Negro. Anybody got that book? Y'all should find that book, The Philadelphia Negro, scattered throughout the better parts of the 7th Ward and on the 12th, lower 17th and 19th streets, here and there in the resident wards of the north, southern, and western sections of the city is a class of race or color of any pupil or scholar who may be in attendance upon seeking and blah, 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 blah. I don't know what in the fuck Du Bois was saying there. Says, there were 53 Negroes in this city in 1896, each of whom owned property valued at $10,000 or more. The aggregate value of all the Negroes in this group in 1896 was $1,500,000. One of the contemporaries of the social scene was Henry M. Minton, the founder of Sigma Pi Phi, that's the boule which means advisors to the king. In presenting in 1913 some historical facts about the history of Negroes in business in Philadelphia before the American Historical Society wrote that these facts should make us feel proud of the colored Philadelphians who have been here before us. They should cause us to hold up our heads and to offer no apology to anyone for being any Negro, for being a Negro. This statement came from one of those whose personal inspiration has been the foundation and development of a fraternal organization for professionals who are college graduates. This organization, with its origin in Philadelphia, would develop into a national position of prestige, power, and service. His record of educational and professional achievements reflected the development of his era. Minton was a product of the South and the North. For him, the elements of these sections were mixed. His educational experiences were so varied that few experiences and contacts which he made were wasted. His parents were Philadelphians, but they were born in Columbia, South Carolina, December 25th, 1871, during the temporary residence. Blah, 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 blah. He has been considered for such memberships, but has not been successful in attaining approval. There were Greek letter fraternities in the institutions which he had attended, but Negroes were excluded from their membership. In some cases, this action was accompanied by a constitutional limitation. At this time, no Greek letter college fraternity had been organized by Negroes. Then goes on to say that among the achievers in this period of organizational activity in New York life stands Henry M. Minton, preeminent. He was the type a pioneer who was devoting his mind and energies to something new and different. His training and experience as a pharmacist made it necessary for him to function also as a businessman. He had to rise above the level of, blah, he was a pharmacist, blah, fuck all that. 
there I'm going to leave this here with you on file. The founding five members of the Alpha Boule, which is what this chapter is called, and they review each of the five members and give their names. The five founding members, Richard J. Warwick, Henry M. Minton, Al Gernon B. Jackson, Edwin C. Howard. And they founded it on May 15, 1904. In fact, in the tape, Coakley does Los Angeles where there was a boule guy in the room that we challenged. He said they never used this book. But in here it says that every May, all boule chapters must study their history book to remind them of the forerunner boule in their history. Dr. Edwin C. Howard was a physician whose house, 508 South 10th Street, was where the first boule meeting was held ever. Is that still in existence? 508 South 10th Street, is that still there? Still there? Somebody need to go check the house. That's the house where the boule had his first meeting. And Howard was born in Boston, Massachusetts. He was the first black medical graduate of Harvard. You have uh, also uh, Dr. Robert James Abley, 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 who was born in Philadelphia June 2nd, 87, educated in the public schools, entered the Institute for Colored Youth in Cheney, graduated in 1890. Following year of teaching, he was admitted to Hanuman Medical School, graduated in 1895 with an MD degree and some more shit. Anyway, we'll save them names. Uh, Eugene Henson was at Cotto Public School of Philadelphia. He became the founder of Mercy Hospital, served on its board and staff here in Philadelphia. Now, in the boule, which is advisor to the king, when they go over, they're known as an archon, which is responsible for relieving the king of his civic duties. We also found on page 28, as you all must have heard, that it was set up on the tenets of Skull and Bones because Minton went to some of the same schools, Yale and Phillips Exeter, whatever that name is, where other Skull and Bones types went to. Says they used Greek history to describe their secret society because their daddy, the one they saw the acquiesce with, was Greek. Therefore, they better know his history to make it in the white world. Here's a copy of what the Boule Journal looks like. That's Mayor Kurt Smoke of Baltimore on the cover. The founding articles on the Boule, which we found public, is July 18, 1990, LA Times, and November 23, 1991, Washington Post. Black fraternal group plays big role in funding Wilder's presidential bid. Shows how Wilder went to Boule chapters in every city to get money to qualify for being on the ballot. So those are the two only known articles besides smaller articles in local papers announcing different parties they were having. Also, this is the LA uh, Times article, Elite Fraternity Widens Agenda for Black Men, front page, LA Times, July 18th, 1990. Now, uh, in some of these other tapes, you'll find a longer, more thorough, even history of the boule. But for the sake of time, I'm gonna read you those names of those people who are here, who are most closest to you. Now, here we go. When I holler out a name, uh, y'all have to holler back to me who they are. First name, it says Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, founded May 4th, 1904. Regular meeting is the first Sunday of each month. So when I read you these names, follow some of these people on the first Sunday so we can find out where the meetings are. This is a proactive project. Mr. Floyd W. Austin, 108 East Sedgwick Street, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Anybody know him? What do we do? Assistant Vice President of Affirmative Action for our first Pennsylvania bank, the white supremacist institution. Right. Okay. Robert L. Archie, Jr. Anybody know him? Holla out, holla out. He's a lawyer. It's good lawyer, bad lawyer. He's bad? Okay, uh, Dr. William C. Atkinson, 822 Chestnut Street, Coatesville, Pennsylvania. Oh, Archie Jr.'s address is 400 West Hortler Street. 
Apartment number 603. Nolan N. Atkinson, Atkinson Jr., attorney. Anybody know him? What'd he do? He Wilson Goods lawyer. Well, that's bad. Dr. Nolan N. Atkinson Sr., 300 Lancaster Avenue, number 907, Winewood, Pennsylvania. Dr. James A. Batts Jr., 433 West Johnson Street, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Dr. Samuel P. Beard Jr., 325 Crest Park Road. William H. Brown III, attorney, 513 Waldron Park Drive. What commission? The MOVE Commission, the one that authorized the killing of the black people, even the shooting of the back, the bombing of the black people done by the whites who later informed the mayor that they did it. Our former chairman of the EOC, yeah, fuck him. Uh, William H. Brown III, 513 Waldron Park Drive, Hav Haverford, Pennsylvania. Dr. Winston M. Bryant, Jr. 5900 Spruce Street, Judge Herbert R. Kane Jr. Just got out of jail, I heard. Yeah? Kane Jr., C-A-I-N, 4900 Winfield Avenue. Dr. Allen E. Chandler, 901 W. Mount Airy Avenue. Dr. Melvin J. Chisholm, 4120 Apologan Road. Dr. Leroy M. Christopi, Christopher, Christophe, 2616 Deepwood Drive, Wilmington, Delaware. Dr. Lewis P. Clark, 83 Willowbrook Avenue, Lansdowne, Pennsylvania. Dr. Maurice C. Clifford, 3831 Oak Road, Philadelphia. Dr. Edward S. Cooper, 6710 Lincoln Drive, Philadelphia. The Honorable Horace A. Davenport, 118 Eskokil, Shokil Avenue. Fuck that, I ain't in the English. I don't want to know how to speak this shit right. I only speak this because I've been conquered. Uh, 2616 Deepwood Drive. Dr. Lewis P. Clark, 83 Willowbrook Avenue, Lansdowne. Dr. Maurice C. Clifford, 38. Oh, I did this. Horace, did I do this? Dr. Edward Cooper, 6710 Lincoln Drive, the Honorable Horace A. Davenport. Okay, Dr. Hart M. Dixon, 10 Elder Avenue, Yeadon, Pennsylvania. Dr. William, excuse me, Dr. Walter R. Edmonds, 257 South 4th Street, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The Reverend William J. Faulkner, 1100 Northwest 61 Street. Uh, Judge James T. Gills, Giles, 346 Rumford Road. Mr. Richard G. Gilmore, 1011 West Allen Lane. The Honorable, no Honorable Wilson Good, 2446 North 59th Street. Mr. Sheldon B. Granger, 5307 Woodbine Avenue. Judge Clifford Scott Green, 2311 North 50th Street. Y'all know him, huh? What y'all, good? Bad. He, he drew up some noise. Uh, who I leave off at? Green? Uh, Reverend William J. Harvey III, 2454 North 59th Street. Dr. Theodore F. Hawkins, 7600 Stinton Avenue. Apartment number 8C. Don't forget, follow them. Write down the address, get the tape from Dale, follow the tape. When you get in the tape, follow them that first Sunday, get there at 12 midnight. Stay, be willing to stay till 12 midnight. When the nigga drive off, drive off with him. When he turn, turn. When he get to the spot, come back and tell Dale. Two, three people ought to be able to follow any of these 50, so that two, three, we get the same confirmation from two, three different sources. Because when I come back on the first Sunday, we're going to go to the meeting. Uh, Hillary H. Holloway, Esquire, 2293 Bryn Mawr Avenue. Judge A. Leon Higginbottom. Uh, 
Mr. A. Romeo Horton, 308 Old Farm Road, Y. Cornett, Pennsylvania. Mr. David M. W. Huggins, 229 Lawrence Drive, Morristown, New Jersey. Dr. Duward L. Hughes, 739 Westview Street, Philadelphia. Mr. Herbert J. Hutton, 636 Burnham Road, Philadelphia. Dr. E. Theodore Jones, 7133 North Mount Pleasant Place, Philadelphia. Dr. Edgar J. Kenton III, 650 Cloverly Lane, Devon, Pennsylvania. The Honorable Julian F. King, who is he? He just died, yeah. The Reverend John R. Logan, Jr., 1230 21st Street. Dr. Walter P. Lomax, Jr., Box 24, Dublin Road, Hilltown, Pennsylvania. Dr. Lancrest McKnight, 35 West 4th Street, Media, Pennsylvania. Mr. Leonard W. Miller, One Declaration Place, Washington Crossing, Pennsylvania. Dr. Russell F. Minton, Sr., 600 Cathedral Road, Richard B. Moore. Sr., 600 Cathedral Road, Richard B. Moore, Esquire, 157 Padham Road, Herbert C. Nelson, Esquire, 596 Hartford Road, Robert, Dr. Robert L. Poindexter, 733 South 21st Street, Reverend Charles L. Poindexter, 7111 McCallum Street, Mr. Malcolm Pryor, 1320 Rose Glen Road, Glen Gladwin, Pennsylvania, Lewis L. Redding, Esquire, Box 95, Loxley Road, Glen Mills, Pennsylvania. Uh, Dr. James Robinson, deceased. Dr. Christopher H. Rohawk, Rolick, Rolock, Ro Rolock, Rolak, Jr., 7137 Lincoln Drive, Philadelphia. Carl Edwards, singly, attorney, 206 Windsor Avenue, Melrose, Pennsylvania. Dr. Henry.